I was a mature student. I just finished at Ruskin and I was going on to Oxford University. And I just joined the Communist Party. I was about 28, something like that, in, 1930, uh, in 1971. Um, and I met Bert at the station. I was uh, chair of the Oxford University Comp Club, which used to invite famous speakers to address uh, students in public meetings um, uh, every so often, every few months. So I, the first time I met Bert was off a train uh, from London. And I was immediately captured by the energy of the man. He wanted to know everything that was going on, who was likely to be at the meeting, uh, what the political climate was, what was the balance of political forces in the Oxford student movement, how strong were the ultra left, will the Labour Party be there? I was exhausted before I actually got back from the, the station to the, to, to the meeting. Anyway, it was a, a warm summer's night, balmy, lovely night, hint of thunder in the air. And when Burke got up in the hall, there was more than a hint of thunder in, in, in the hall. It, it was tremendous, a really uplifting experience. Here was Bert on the ground where he was strongest, combining his knowledge of law and employment law and the role that law plays in class society with his knowledge of the labour movement uh, and the way that the labour movement had to organise the struggle uh, to change the world. And he got up and for 50 minutes he hectored, he shouted, he spoke quietly on occasion. He had the audience just there all the time during this 50 minutes. Then of course it came to questions and discussions. And there was every one of 57 varieties of trots uh, in the hall that night, about 150 people. And they came up with the Communist Party to sell out, and the trade union leadership can't be trusted, we must have a general strike tomorrow, the usual sorts of things. And Bert answered, and of course um, he did so with uh, great, um, if you like, understanding, he, he wasn't belittling in any way, but he answered them point by point. And of course he absolutely destroyed all of their arguments. And he did so uh, without, I think, upsetting anyone in the hall that night. And I left that meeting in my late twenties, recently joined the Communist Party. And <coughs> I think I can say it was the start of my political life. Because that meeting gave me an understanding and, uh, of uh, what was possible uh, uh, and how uh, a revolution could be built uh, in Britain. He was a big man with a powerful voice, a very powerful voice. I remember him <coughs> speaking outside the Leeds Town Hall regularly on Fridays. And he used to have lots and lots of people um, gathering to hear him. But you could actually hear him at the other end of the hedgerow virtually because he had such a strong voice. If anybody knows Leeds, hedgerow is the main road that goes right past the town hall for quite a long way. Um, he was a brilliant organiser and this was one of the things that I found quite remarkable about him. That somebody could be in a prisoner of war camp in Italy and organise people, the, the men By the way, if you've not people. sat in Ramelson's kitchen with him, deaf as a post, <laughs> and with uh, Bill Alexander, deaf as a post, <laughs> uh, arguing with one another and being in the middle trying to keep order. Um, in fact, I was very quietly spoken until I met birds. Uh, <laughs> what you hear is definitely a legacy. Parenthesis <laughs> always understood the different functions, roles of the shop stewards movement, the union branch, the national union, the trades council, the TUC and the Labour Party, but also saw those linkages. And never did he do as the ultra left might do. Some one thing fits all. One answer to all the problems at a, every particular moment in the development. But the crisis of capital has become, for everyone, a crisis of labour. Unemployment, low wages, falling wages, 
more unemployment. So the whole basis of Burt's Marxist legacy, the Marxist analysis, lives with us today. The only credible analysis of the crisis is that it's a crisis of power and a crisis of struggle and a crisis of capitalism. So that's the first thing. Burt understood more than anybody else that when you come to it, Marxism is about the three trilogy, the trilogy, the three elements, the state, the class, and the party. And it was the relationship between the class, the party, and the state that was his great genius, was his understanding of what he left for us to appreciate in his writing. I wanted just to say work. a word about Bert, from my experience. But Baruch Ramilovich, that was his, his name. And I used to speak to him, especially when I didn't want anybody else to understand, in Hebrew or Yiddish, because he spoke both fluently. And I just wanted to say something about Bert's role in the party, because he stood by us, especially at when we got expelled, um, the London 22, the first person I saw outside Hammersmith Town Hall was none other than Baruch Ramilovich. You know, Bert, who had been such a party loyalist, saw immediately what was happening, saw immediately that the party was turning in on itself and was expelling its finest cadres, and he couldn't stand it. He absolutely couldn't stand it. So I think he actually, although he didn't write a book, and there's something that I think ought to be, well, I'm sure you know, and I'm sure it's in, in your book, he wrote pamphlets which actually really changed the world. Well, not changed the world, changed Britain. The one on the incomes policy, I mean, there were several of them, and which um, I think were absolutely, for, I, I hope they're all mentioned, yes. What good. Um, but so if you if you put all that corpus of work together, it's almost like a book. It is, you know. Some fools gladly, that was quite sure. Um, some people found him difficult to cope with. He, partly I think because <clears> of his <throat> loud, dominant voice, which um, he used to great effect, especially when he was collecting money at, at various meetings. I've, I've got a, a, a quote here. Uh, from from the book, talking about um, uh, talking about Bert, of course, and it's a letter uh, from a worker in Middlesbrough, and he's writing um, just after or, or during the Seaman Strike of 1966, in which Bert was a, an extraordinarily powerful influence and figure. And what he said, what what this worker said was this: the Prime Minister and others seem to be all against communist Bert Ramelson. Allow me to say something in his favour. Ramelson was a prisoner of war in the same camp as myself and many other Teesiders. They can all verify that his lively political debates were the only thing we had to pass our time away. And if we had all had half his guts, we would, in, we would be overpowering the guards and taking over the camp, as Bert was always wanting the prisoners to do. He couldn't possibly remember me, remember me, but I most certainly remember him in his tan tanks called Beret and an old pair of faded shorts, talking to whole crowds of prisoners of war where our duty lay, and that was to overpower the lot and take over the camp. I refer to the Tarhuna camp, Long Memory, Middlesbrough. That was the sort of impact that Bert had on people, and he spoke to these prisoners of war, thousands of them at a time in open air meetings about Marxism, about the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917, about the need for socialism uh, in Britain. And uh, he obviously made some contribution to Labour's uh, election man landslide victory in 1945, because I'm sure Burke would have convinced thousands of his fellow uh, soldiers about uh, a number of political truths and what was possible. Burke liked an argument. And he liked an argument because he liked to be tested and he respected the people he argued with. He was tolerant of discussion, it doesn't matter how much he shouted. People got used to that. And his hearing, unlike his eyesight, was not improved with life, uh, with the years. 
he had the ability not to reject new ideas as they arose, but to see, now maybe they've got something interesting in them. That's the sort of thing that people often lose beyond the age of 20 or 21. He was not susceptible to flattery. He was intellectually modest. Now, he never wrote a book. And when I asked him why, he said, I'm too bloody busy. You know, I'm a pamphleteer. I, I think he only told me one fib, and it's in this card. And it's uh, July 89. And uh, he was in Riga uh, for a holiday with Joan. And he wrote, and he said, we're enjoying fresh air, good food, and beautiful seascapes. At that time, some of you may remember, there was the first major miners' strike in the Soviet Union for many a, a decade. And he says, we're thousands of miles from the striking coal fields, so I couldn't have had anything to do with it. <laughs> now, my view is simple. If Bert was alive and on the planet and there was a strike, he must have been involved. <laughs> well, I used to spend a long time talking about everything, not about football. Um, I'd always talk about football with anyone, but Bert didn't know anything at all about football. He didn't know anything at all about cricket, even though he was a Yorkshireman. You know, by he didn't know very much outside of, um, of popular culture at all. Um, but he was a very cultured man and uh, a wonderful uh, rapporteur and conversation. So all this emanated from this one. He was like a figurehead in Yorkshire and a lot of Leeds people knew him, not just in the party and the trade union movement, but just ordinary members of the public, because there he was every Friday on his uh, soapbox, telling everybody what they ought to know. He was also a lousy driver. Now, he was in the tank corps in Libya, as it's called now. And I don't think he ever learned the difference, as he was driving, between what constituted, it didn't matter if you were in a tank, a moving car or a one that was stationary. And many people refused to drive with him. Nobody can be And by that saying perfect. that, you know, Bert was a fantastic leader. And regardless of what people thought of him, he fought through the uh, International Brigade being a prisoner of war. He fought through the Cold War. He, he did so many things. Uh, if only we had more people like So he understood. Today. He never gave up on any part of the struggle. If you've got a left-wing trade union leader, you don't say, ah, you're a leader, therefore no longer part of it. You don't take a shock for activist and say, you're just an activist, you're an economistic. No labels, please. That was really his position. Don't label people. Don't push them away. Don't say, that's it. You don't understand. And that's the point Mick and others have been making, isn't it? That you do listen. You do understand. You do appreciate above all else that everyone has a contribution. And if you neglect any part of the struggle, you neglect he the whole part. He was organiser. He said, if you want to make an impact on somebody, ring them up at 7 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> Myself and all the family, I hope you have a lovely evening and wish great success for the book, trusting that it will inform and inspire present and future generations in the continuing struggle for a just society. Love, John Ramelson. Thanks, John. For the Times, he was an industrial militant. For The Guardian, a shop floor strategist. A militant with strategy, said The Independent. And the Daily Telegraph, often the most political of uh, that kind of paper, a fighter in the class war. For the Morning Star, he was a communist fighter. Now, I think this book, which really uh, is worth reading and distributing, adds, I think, a fundamental corrective to the line that runs through those obituaries and to the way in which those who know about Bert but have not had the experience of working with him uh, of course, uh, when might be given. Prisoner of war, he was taken to Italy, to Ancona, and uh, he led a mass walkout of the prison camp and walked some 400 miles to meet the British troops who were in the south of Italy at the time. So, this is another reason for choosing Bandiella Rossa to start off with.
bandiera rossa, bandiera rossa, avanti popolo alla riscossa.